Welcome, welcome everybody as uh, the doors, the Zoom doors are opening and we're getting ready to start the conversation with uh, Wanjira Matai. Um, we'll be starting in a, in a couple of minutes and uh, it's great to, to see people coming in and uh, some at a very, very early hour I see from California. All right. It is really, really a pleasure to be continuing this uh, dialogue series on uh, UNAPAT 50. We started in May with a conversation with uh, UNAP's executive director, Inger Anderson, to kick off a year long celebration of UNAP's 50th anniversary. And uh, we are continuing now. Uh, we had a conversation with uh, Achim Steiner in June, uh, UNEP's former executive director and currently administrator of the UN Development Program. Um, we are going to continue every, every month. We took a break for the summer. Um, since we are at an academic institution, the University of Massachusetts, Boston, we took the summer off and we are now continuing. We will have uh, conversations to celebrate this remarkable 50th anniversary of uh, what I call the Anchor Institution for the Global Environment with uh, conversations with prominent leaders in the space of global environmental governance. And uh, it's, really, it's really a pleasure to be welcoming my colleague and friend, Wanjira Matai today. Wanjira, welcome. Welcome to this space. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, I Maria. We'll introduce you uh, briefly and we'll have a, a conversation to, today. Um, because uh, both, both of us are keenly aware of the global problems today and also of the leadership that is necessary. And the leadership role that UNEP, the organization that is uh, in the city where you live, it's headquartered in Nairobi, uh, has to play. And so um, let's continue this, this year long celebration by posing questions and having conversations that help improve this uh, organization and also the way we do governance. So Wanjira Matai is currently the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at WRI, the World Resources Institute. And uh, it's, she's based in, in Kenya. She is also the chair of the Wangari Matai Foundation and the former chair of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. That's the organization that her mother, Wangari Matai, who is the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, founded in 1977. Wangari is an inspirational leader with over 20 years of experience advocating for social and environmental change and has been working on climate change, on youth leadership, on sustainable energy and landscape restoration. Manjira, it truly is an honor to welcome you here today. Um, Thanks, Maria. Delighted to be here. So let's kick this conversation off by getting to know Wanjira, Wanjira the individual. I'll just start by saying how, we, how we've come to know each other. And it has been many, many years. And it is because of, of your mother, of Wangari Matai, who was a uh, fellow at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at the time where I was doing my um, master's and my PhD. <laughs> um, and now is the Yale School for the Environment. And uh, as a, a fellow there, she was so open to all of the students and uh, we connected and became, be became colleagues and friends. And then we uh, worked on several issues together. And when I taught a class on UNEP, 
at Yale and decided that we will be taking all of the students in that class to Nairobi to present the first ever outside evaluation done by this, this class to, to UNEP. Um, Wangari Matai welcomed us to, to come to Nairobi and engage with the Green Belt uh, movement. She had just be become the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and yet she welcomed us to Nairobi, engaged with us fully, and um, now was 2005. And so it's in this setting that I have worked with your mom and with you, met you in, in the course of these events, and uh, we have you know, followed each other's, other's works and collaborated. But so let's step back and hear in your words, who is Wanjira, the individual? What is the evolution, personal, professional, that has led you to where you are today? Because you hold a remarkable position. Yes, Maria, thank you very much for that introduction. And absolutely, it has been, it's hard to believe that uh, actually I must have met you at Yale when I, I visited my mother. Uh, when she was a fellow there, she re six months that she loved and, and were in many ways quite seminal for her going forward in especially uh, investing in education, in higher education on, on the environment. But my, my background and, and, you know, I was born and raised in Kenya, so very much uh, at home here and went through my formative years of education here and then left for college to the United States, upstate New York, and then did my graduate and studied biology and chemistry, and then did my graduate work in public health uh, at the university at Emory University in Atlanta. Subsequently, worked for quite a few years, uh, six years in public health and disease eradication. And those were, you know, wonderful years. I knew that a lot of my um, what gave me energy, now I can say, was working with people, working with communities. And, and even though I had studied hard science, I was really keen that I wanted to spend time. And thanks to a lot of good advisors, I was directed to a field of public health that I, I previously hadn't known much about. But I spent six years working on diseases that I knew nothing about before and that had actually been a big part of my part of the world, you know, dracanculiasis and schistosomiasis. Of course, I knew schistosomiasis, bilharzia, but some of the others I really didn't know. And it opened my eyes to, you know, this interface of, of uh, health and the environment. And a lot of all of those diseases were diseases that had to do with some contamination of the environment or something, some imbalance that was caused um, in the environment. Subsequently, I would decide I want to take a break after those six years. And I came back to Kenya. You, you know, what, do you, what does one do when they want to take a break? You go home. <laughs> and I came and it was during my time at home taking a break that my mother would draw me into her work more directly. So I was home. I was not working as far as she was concerned. So I, I got involved with her you know, day slowly by slowly, she roped me and I say, and it was an absolutely magical time. I ended up working with her for, for I would say 11 years, every single day. And it was in that time that I really got to understand her passion, what drove her, her really intricate connection between what, we, what was needed in terms of action, but also what was needed from communities in terms of their own understanding of their responsibility and their role in transforming their natural environments. So I got brought into the sector quite um, dramatically, but in many ways cemented because I just fell in love with everything that she was doing. And it was in till 2000 and really 2004 when I decided I wanted to, to come back and, and pursue um, my career and in some ways it had evolved that she won the Nobel Peace Prize. And when that was announced, Maria, I couldn't leave her. So I stayed on and continued working with her. And so it all just, in, in so many ways, it has been um, some of the most amazing years of my life was those moments when decisions were being made in a snap, should I leave or should I not? Should I do or should I not? And fortunately, I, I made the right decision. So I find myself, 
you know, here in, in some ways, one of the many custodians of my mother's legacy, the environmental legacy, especially grassroots leadership in environmental work, but also looking at some of the more uh, futuristic work that has to be done around the environment, issues of climate justice now that we are facing them and issues of, um, of, uh, of the just transition and what that means. And so my work today at the World Resources Institute, I tell people is a culmination of everything I've ever done. I am literally at the intersection of all the things I've worked on and it's, it's a place of privilege and I, I totally uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Wanjira. Wangari truly was an environmental defender. And uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see how you continue that, that legacy and the lessons that you have uh, integrated. It's not that you have learned, you've integrated in, in your life and, uh, and moving, moving forward. Both you and Wangari feature prominently in the book that uh, I published uh, this year. Uh, celebrating UNEP's 50th uh, anniversary, UNEP, UNEP at, uh, at 50. And uh, there, there are many stories about Wangari's relationship with, uh, with UNEP, the, the work that she was doing in, uh, in Nairobi. One of the most prominent ones is the story of the Karura forest. And in that story is contained to a great degree this almost dilemma relationship with UNEP between these grassroots um, environmental activists and this international organization that was finding its own uh, roots and its own identity. So tell us a little bit about uh, one, the re your read of, of the book, but then also the prominence and the, the Karura forest story that, uh, that is really such a, an important story in, uh, in Nairobi and in Kenya more broadly. Yeah. You know, Maria, my mother was um, very close to UNEP. And, and one of the things that is important to appreciate is the fact that it was the people at UNEP that made UNEP. And so it was Klaus Topfer, it was Donald Kanyaru, it was people like those who, who were really strong environmentalists and regardless of what the institution may have expected, they were drawn by their own sense of purpose and their own, own commitments to, to and for Donald Kanyaru to Kenya. He was a Kenyan and he is a Kenyan. And I think it, it's, so, it's so important that because in the, literally UNEP is nestled against this beautiful Karura forest, which is really the largest urban forest in the world, in, in, certainly in Africa, and I understand the second largest in the world. It's a beautiful forest that has, uh, it, if you consider that it was in the late 80s into the 90s when this battle to save Karura forest was underway and the President Moy had parceled it out into small parcels and was dishing it out to friends and cronies. And the, the, the Green, the word got to, to my mother that this forest was at risk and she and the Greenbelt movement thought that would be an absolute abomination to everything that we work for and certainly not right there on the nose that she would in many ways uh, shine a light on UNEP which was right there and she had a lot of allies, a lot of friends but there were the clear tensions between what UNEP could actively do and what they couldn't do. And so you, you, you knew that even though we were literally on their doorstep, you wouldn't see Klaus Stopfer in the middle of, of, of giving a speech outside uh, the Karura forest in support, even though he supported, even though as a friend of Wangari, he was concerned for her safety and, and would in many ways make provisions through that uh, institutions, through the compound, that ensured that she was safe. But none of that was, was uh, part of the portfolio that UNEP expected or would have been expected to respond to. And I, th I think even just reading your book, it was fascinating to see, Maria, just how much that played out in more ways than one. I was not aware of all the other ways that it was happening, but it was a clear um, 
conflict within for an institution that was nestled in Nairobi to not be able to do more um, responding to. And, and, and I know that eventually UNEP did embrace a lot of technical assistance work and start to, to say that, you know, we are here and this is part of the reality of being in this environment. But it was quite, um, I think that be, remains a stark example of what that conflict actually looked like. On, on that note, Wanjira, as uh, you're an activist outside the UN system, and yet you also realize the importance of the UN system to global collective action. So what are the opportunities that you see that the UN and UNEP in particular present for Kenya, for East Africa, and indeed uh, globally for the, for the global issues that, that you are uh, championing? You know, I mean, one of the most important things is that UNEP as a UN agency comes with a certain amount of clout, a certain amount of authority. Even when people don't quite understand the fine print, there is a certain uh, stature to the United Nations and, and an understanding of their global role that, that is protective and in, in some ways also uh, brings with it a certain legitimacy. I think the UNEP has continued to, to do a really good job and at that time as well, keeping the environmental agenda front and center. Without that, we would, you know, we would be struggling to say it's important. We have an institution, UNEP, that is focused on the environment. And so that makes that agenda important. And for that single reason alone, Maria, it is important that it is there and it is, it is actually um, representing that agenda. And we can argue in many ways, despite all the challenges, that it's thanks to the fact that it was there that we have continued to have the environment up and down the global agenda, up and down the political agenda, but now front and center. And, and UNEP through all that, and you can see it as the different executive directors have morphed and evolved the role into different things, that that has been a really good thing that it was there and sustained by the existence of that institution. So I think that that, that was the most important thing, the, the prominence and visibility of the environmental agenda. How has that played out in, uh, in Kenya? Um, what has Kenya gained from the presence of an international institution in, uh, in Nairobi? And how, how do you see Kenya and indeed Africa, now that you are the director for Africa of, of WRI, being able to, to use uh, that platform and to leverage it for broader environmental outcomes? Well, it's, you know, just having, like I said, having UNEP in Kenya has given Kenya a certain global uh, reputation, certainly certain global um, posture that is, that is respectable. And, and with it has obviously come, um, and, and this you would have to ask our heads of state whether it has actually played out, but I, I would suspect it has, that we've gotten quite a bit of respect uh, as, an, as a country that is hosting the premier institution, United Nations institution focused on the environment. And as the environment has become more and more important, more and more central, I think Nairobi too has become an important center um, and a spotlight on, on all things environment. I mean, it, it has not prevented uh, episodes of poor governance, like the, the efforts to to, uh, to take on Uhuru Park or to take on um, Karura Forest, but we certainly have waved the UNEP flag. We have UNEP here. We cannot be the ones to be seen to be doing uh, things that are not environmental. And so we've taken our environmental label very seriously as Kenyans. And I think that has been in large part because of the, the, the confidence that was placed in Kenya to host and to continue hosting 50 years on the United Nations Environment Program. So I think that definitely has helped um, politically, globally. 
That, that's right. I am going to, I'm seeing some questions pop up that our team is, uh, is sending, sending to me. I would like to ask uh, all uh, participants to put questions in the Q&A function, and then we'll, we'll integrate them into the conversation as best we can. But I see Richard Jordan has already asked a question about uh, the new Secretary General's report, our common agenda. And I know you just came back from New York, where you were attending the uh, discussions around the, the General Assembly. And uh, Richard asks, uh, what do you think, Wanjira, would member states go along with the proposals of this futurist-oriented mechanisms that the Secretary General proposes, such as a futures laboratory and enhanced youth assembly? You know, I really especially loved the idea of the Enhanced Youth Assembly because I think youth, um, as we speak, youth are gathering in Milan yeah, in the, on the road to COP. And I think it's the first time that youth have actually been given a platform to express themselves and to share what they believe to be uh, the priorities going into COP. And it's an important momentum setting event. I've listened in to some of the, the, the remarks that are coming out. These are young people who are absolutely distressed by the lack of action, the lack of ambition that we are seeing. So I think it's a really important piece of perhaps an important mechanism to be added to bringing more um, momentum and seriousness and reminder of just what this moment calls for. So absolutely, I really think our common agenda is, is, you know, the Secretary General has continued to play an important role in as much as he can in this voluntary uh, Paris regime to push for, for, some, for some ambition, for as much ambition as possible. But I think the youth will be the ones. I'm reminded often that young people at this age uh, in many movements that have made a difference have often been inspired in their teens. And then in, it is only in their mid twenties when big things happen. So this is, this is crucial. And I think it is quite um, visionary of the secretary general. It would be really interesting to see how this plays out and what, how it is practically designed, created, implemented, um, which also makes me, um, think it's a conversation that you and I have been having uh, many times, Wanjira, about uh, the pledges, the commitments that are being made at the United Nations, whether it's in New York, in Nairobi, or during the various conferences of the parties, like we are awaiting the one in, in Glasgow. Governments commit various actors, businesses, even NGOs, like the one that you are now part of, commit and promise, make promises. What is the accountability for the delivery on, on these promises? And then what is perhaps the role of, of youth? And maybe that youth mechanism could help us create some, some new innovative accountability mechanisms. How do we hold governments accountable? Right. No, that has been the biggest challenge, the lack of accountability structures, uh, even especially in, in situations like this, where it, it, a lot of these are voluntary commitments. And, and you, but you do have to hold them accountable because this is going to make the difference in the survival of this human experiment, as we're calling it sometimes. But I think it is, uh, it, these commitments are crucial because they help us have a North Star. We need to know where we are going, how we are heading. But I think institutions like UNEP, as we have evolved, as it has evolved through the different roles, perhaps this is the moment when it becomes this um, neutral accountability hub because it is important for us to know, even for youth as they push their agenda, that they have the data in their hands, that they understand for sure what is expected, what the commitments were, and what then, um, where then the pressure needs to be put. Because it is movements that will change systems now. This going forward is really about strong movement building and that accountability uh, requires the right amount of data 
And, and I think an organization like UNEP is really well placed to play that role in, a, in this sector of the environment. But you're right, we have to be held accountable. My organization uh, included, I hope we are meeting our commitments, but I definitely know that without accountability, transparency, then it's, it's, it can be a show for the gallery. So yes, we do need those structures and we need to be able to, to shift some of what the frameworks we already have. We have, we have an organization here that is already set up. And like I said, I'm in, in many ways prepared for this moment. And I think this is one of the opportunities that can be taken into the future. And uh, as you know, we, ha we have a tool that we have developed here at the Center for Governance and Sustainability uh, with uh, Natalia Escobar Penderti, whom you, you know well also, one of our PhD program graduates and now a professor at Universidad Eafit in Colombia. I think Natalia is in Colombia right, right now, is joining us uh, as a, as a participant briefly, but uh, the work that, that, that we have been doing in the center has created this tool to assess to what extent are countries fulfilling their commitments to implement the various environmental agreements. And we're finding a rather counterintuitive story that many developing countries are actually fulfilling their commitments. Uh, but what's really interesting, there's not one country in the world that is doing equally well on all of the conventions. Um, but as in WRI now, you are working with these various environmental organizations, the environmental uh, conventions, but at the same time, you're also lifting it up, stepping, stepping back and looking at the sustainability puzzle. So this is something that now with the debates in the UN, with the sustainable development goals, we are thinking about how does environment fit within the sustainability puzzle? Where do you stand on, on that? And uh, what is kind of the cutting edge thinking about uh, environment in sustainability? Well, look, it is hilarious because my mother always used to say to me, the environment is everything. She said right. it is everything with respect to um, budgetary allocations often receive so little, but without the environment, the rest are non-existent. So I think that has proven itself. We are in a situation today facing the crisis of our lives and it is a crisis, it is an environmental crisis in many ways that the plunder of the environment, the, the lack of a sustainable management of the, of the natural environment has led us to this point. We are home, most of us, because of this COVID pandemic. And that is a real indicator. The entire planet came to a halt because of this uh, imbalance in nature. So Maria, the environment is everything. You know? There was, I wrote in, uh, in the book and then in a little article on, on nature, in, in Nature, Nature magazine that summarized the book, that in the 70s, the, many of the specialized agencies used to tease UNEP to say that UNEP stood for the United Nations Everything Program. And uh, I say, UNEP. You have to rise up to that acronym. You have to be the United Nations Everything Program because the environment is everything. And so it's actually really great to hear that this is what Wangari Matai was also saying. And I have heard her stories in, in Nairobi saying how without the forest, there's no water. Without water, there is no food. Without food, we just can't sustain ourselves and how important it is that the environment is the foundation of, uh, of everything. This is indeed what Achim Steiner uh, championed, is that the environment is not a pillar. It is the foundation for the other elements of sustainability, the social, the economic uh, uh, issues. And so it's, it's really great to be coming full circle and to seeing the, the centrality of, uh, of UNEP in, uh, in, in this sense. So that's, that, that's, that's great. I wanna, I wanna step back a, a little bit uh, here, Wanjira, and um, 
to ask you about leadership because you, you've seen it. You've gro grown up seeing a leader uh, in, in action and you yourself were a leader in, in the making. But we're thinking about leadership in an individual capacity, but also in an institutional capacity. What are the key requirements, not only the key characteristics, but how, how does one become a leader when it's an individual? And how do we nurture an institution to become a leader? Yeah, well, I always feel like leaders emerge. So they are not, they don't create themselves. They busy themselves doing what they need to do. And they emerge as leaders because people will follow. People will follow where they feel they can, there is trust. Trust is forever the chief driver of leadership. If people feel that the data being delivered from this institution is trustworthy, then they will always consider them the leader in this particular uh, area. So trust is a really important part of it. Engagement is crucial. I, th I think you can never sit on the sidelines. Uh, leaders are always in the arena. You have to be inside, you have to, um, you have to know what you're talking about by having experienced some of it. And I think that was partly, I saw it with, with Klaus Topfer, I certainly saw it with Akim Steiner, who people who were so committed to the cause that sometimes the line between the bureaucracy and what they needed to do to support and to be uh, present and to engage and to show up for, for causes they believed in, would sometimes, there would sometimes be a healthy tension there. So engagement and, and showing up, I think, is, is part of what leaders do. Those would be my top two. I'm sure there are many, many more. <laughs> That's great. And I see Deborah Leipziger is reacting and saying, thank you for your inspiration and leadership, uh, Wanjira. And uh, her question is, what are some of the best examples about the just transition in Africa and globally? I guess part of most, right now we are dealing a lot with the issue of, of energy. Energy mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, as we're talking about um, the global ambition to cut, to cut global emissions, we know that um, the fossil fuel, the role of fossil fuels is crucial. It's wonderful to see in our lifetimes coal come to a, a halt and, and, and the signals that have been sent first by the G7 and then followed by South Korea, Japan, and then just last week, China, uh, saying that there shall be no more, certainly there, a lot of them had ended local um, investments in coal, but the, the investments overseas in coal had not ended. And I think that was an important, significant signal. A just transition is about making sure that people are not left behind as we make these transitions from one thing to the next. The, the just energy transition is, is one very good one because there, there are um, countries, especially in the global south, where poverty and development are still extremely crucial uh, elements of, of, of their agenda. And part of a just transition for them would mean that they would need to have significant financing to be able to make the transition, for example, to 100% renewables. And therefore one can expect that there will be a delay in the transition away from fossil fuels, especially in developing countries that their priority to industrialize, to develop, and to lift their people out of poverty takes prominence. And that prominence requires energy. And that energy will therefore mean that they may be a little later in giving up, uh, in, in giving up the fossil fuel um, commitment. However, the countries that have built their economies and their wealth on fossil fuels must be the first to wean themselves from those fossil fuels. And that is where the justice in the transition comes in. 
So you've worked quite a bit on climate justice. Is this the 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 area, Wanjira, or is there is there more in that climate justice space that you have? Been well, there's talking? a lot in the climate justice space. It, it, the, the whole adaptation agenda, the issue of loss and damage. Mm -hmm. We are living as we speak in the era of loss and damage. Um, everywhere, I think I don't know one part of the world this summer that does not have a good experience of the drama, whether it was flooding, fires. Uh, droughts in my part of the world, locusts. It was across the globe. People were facing losses and damages. In the global south, these losses and damages are being faced for reasons directly climate related. And because they are not responsible in any way, 3% of global emissions can be attributed to Africa. The rest, the G20 are responsible for 80% of global emissions. They must therefore be responsible in this just transition for the climate finance that's required to ensure that countries are able to make the, uh, the necessary transitions, invest in the necessary technologies and technology transfer to make sure that they can adapt and mitigate against the worst impacts of climate change. So that is another um, uh, just transition agenda. But the climate justice agenda has got to be a priority and it's got to be a priority for all of us. We're going to see an increase certainly in the global south and the countries which have, uh, are most vulnerable to climate change, an increase in their necessity, their absolute necessity to put in place adaptation strategies that will cost significant amounts and so out of COP26, Maria, we're hoping to see real commitments to climate finance because th that climate finance is desperately needed to ensure that countries can make the, the investments they need to cushion themselves against a problem they did not cause. Very good. Um, let me integrate some of the questions that are coming in. I'd also like participants, please put the questions in the Q&A space rather than in, in the chat as it's uh, easier, easier to follow. But I'm picking up one from one of our students, Jack Whitaker. He is uh, asking you, Anjira, how do you imagine the future of environmental education? Digital education and how to balance that with the environment? That's a great question. In my TED talk, I talked about the fact that the Wangari Mathai Foundation is really committed to environmental education, but the, fact, the important part of that is that it starts early, that we have to embed environmental education into experiential learning for children, that they, they experience nature, that they spend time in nature as part of the environmental education curriculum. Because we know that the more you spend time, the more you fall in love with a space, the more protective you will be of it and the more you're going to, you, you will understand it. And I think that's really uh, a crucial part of environmental education. Today, environmental education is often much later in the, in the curriculum. And I think that it should start much earlier. It's a requirement that children in Kenya spend time in a forest near them and spend time working on a project. We have a wonderful coastline. We have wonderful mountains. We have wonderful rivers and forests in urban and rural settings that each of us must know and grow knowing um, some of those forests. And that will, become, that will pepper and, and certainly cement in us who we become. It's a function of the experiences we have. I'm always struck, Maria, when, my, when people ask, where my mother was not an environmentalist by training. She was a, a biologist and she studied biology, was teaching you know, veterinary anatomy in, in the University of Nairobi when she made the connections that were quite environmental and shifted her career to an environmental career. She always attributed her environmentalism to her childhood. The time spent playing with tadpoles in rivers the time spent watching rivers flow that seemed crystal clear that you could see the very bottom. And she was haunted by that beauty and would later commit her life to making sure that she could restore the beauty and wonder of nature that she grew up with. And uh, this is why the Karura Forest is so precious. And we've been several times the Wangari corner in the Karura Forest and uh, just, just walking through the forest and experiencing it 
it brings exactly that sense of connection, of uh, integration. And it's, it's so important that it, it literally abuts the UNEP uh, campus, the, the, the UNEP compound. It's Karura Forest right, right behind uh, UNEP in, in Nairobi. Let me see, uh, there, there are more questions coming in here. Uh, Wanjira, here is uh, our colleague and friend, Philip Osano of the Stockholm Environment Institute in Nairobi. And Philip is asking, how can we strengthen the capacity of environmental NGOs and institutions in the South to amplify the local voices and experiences? Um, he says many of the Southern environmental NGOs that were started together with UNEP, such as uh, the Environmental Liaison Center International, ELCI, are no longer as influential as uh, when they were established. Is there a role for international NGOs to support national and local ones? Oh, P Philip, what a great question. I mean, that is absolutely what we must do. Maria, one of the things that I've been talking about is we have to, prior philanthropy has to prioritize local NGOs uh, that are working across the board. Civil society is going to be the single most important cog in the wheel for a, a climate action on the ground because climate action is really action on the ground. And so for that to happen, we're going to have to seed more movements, seed more local NGOs and invest in local leadership in ways we have not done before. And one of the areas that I think is crucially important is in uh, the, the area of environmental defense. We talked a lot, a little bit in the very beginning. Environmental defenders are currently, I think if anyone saw the latest report, the, the, that this last year, so the, the highest number of deaths of environmental defenders around the world. We have got to double down our support for them, our protection of them, and our investment in more and more local organizations. Because now the work that needs to be done is at that level. It is at the grassroots, it is at the national level. And it is those local organizations who are at the front lines, but often who get the least resources to do the work they need to do. I'm really proud of my organization because just a month ago, Maria, we launched uh, an, um, a call to support grassroots uh, entrepreneurs and um, projects that are working in restoration, small on the ground restoration projects. We want to, the top 100 to start, but we're hoping this will be a movement that spars as part of AFR 100. We need more of those in the food sector, in the set sector around urbanization. We need as many of us out there. So Philip, I hope we can connect and work on building local movements. This is absolutely the moment for it. And, and if we, in this decade in particular, so that we can capture the gains, even as we work on the global uh, governance issues and all of the, the commitments that need to be made in the climate vulnerable countries, we've got to make sure our NGOs on the ground are well healed. That's, that's a very important point. And we now have some a comment and a question from Estelle Young that is a little bit kind of challenging that. And she is, is saying, as opposed to grassroots activities, what is the role of a larger organization whose top-down method and style could be more effective and easier to attract funding? So what is your take advice on those who would like to capitalize on this conservation to scale up the magnitude of the project or the site? So it's an interesting dichotomy here that we're seeing in even from the participants, the role of grassroots and then the role of, of aggregators. Right. Well, you know, we have to be, and my organization could be considered one of those large ones, but mm -hmm. one of the things that we are very clear about is we have to create space. We have to create opportunities and, uh, and nurture those, especially in, in the areas where we are. So that is why a lot of international organizations, what they're sold, are investing in leadership that is local. You're not going to see a lot of organizations who are, who are genuinely trying to make change happen, invest in leadership that is not from that area. Because we, that is our job. Our job is now to create opportunities, to consolidate, 
to move resources as much as we can to the grassroots. It has not been done before, but it certainly is still what needs to happen. Great. Um, let's, um, questions are, are pouring in now and uh, we have another about 14, 15 minutes. And, uh, and Kasi uh, Wodu is one of our first year students in, uh, in the program from, from Nigeria. And Kasi is asking, what do you think Africa and the world need to do more to avert the effects of climate change on conflict? Sorry, Maria, say that question again. So what do we need in Africa in particular, let's say, to avert the effect of climate change on conflict? So climate and conflict. Well, climate and conflict really directly right here in Kenya, we had the one of the worst, we are in, in, in a drought. There's a declaration of drought in the Northern part of Kenya. And the way drought manifests itself often is through conflict because we have a clash between pastoralists and people who are farmers and and each looking for to secure their livelihoods. The animals have to eat and drink, and of course people have their farms. So we've got to address this issue head on. Part of addressing climate change is addressing conflict. They, these are interconnected issues, and they will, they've always been, that we cannot have uh, peace if you don't have sustainable management of the environment. And so part of the policy space is ensuring that we, we cement the protection of uh, and sustainable use, especially of grasslands, where a lot of the conflict in my part of the world are. But a lot of conflict around water, a lot of conflict around, but if you think about it, the destruction of watersheds higher up has resulted in this conflict of water. And so we've got to have a more systemic approach to it, where we invest in the protection of watersheds and invest in the restoration of landscapes that have will then bring about the sort of uh, restoration that will take care of it. But it will take time. And that's why we are saying this is uh, a very serious moment, especially for climate vulnerable countries, because the losses and damages that are coming from the impacts, including climate, including conflict, including heat waves, loss of life and property are significant. So absolutely, we have to see this as very interconnected. Yeah. In, in in a sense, you also answered the question from uh, Rabesh, uh, who also said that he works in internal conflict uh, affected and disaster affected country. And uh, that uh, he, he's working on these fundamental issues that uh, you just talked about. So there are a lot of people working on conflict and, and environment. I also want to bring in another question from uh, one of our of our students uh, from, uh, from Pakistan, Ali. He says, uh, his question is, while efforts for just transition are underway, what can be done for communities, especially in the rural parts of a country that are hard hit by environmentally induced tragedies? How do we yeah. deal with the communities? I mean, in a sense, you talked about the loss and damage, but when, when it is at that personal level, the community level, the, in the rural parts, who should do what? Yeah, well, this is important because part of the social structures, when we saw it happen, when the floods hit Germany, Angela Merkel was able to marshal $300 million to support those uh, who were affected directly. And being able to do that in disaster risk preparedness arrangements for our, our countries is equally important. And that is what a lot of the resources are going to do. But it will take a lot of transparency and accountability as well from our countries to be able to make sure that the social systems that are put in place to cushion people in times of need actually go to those people. And so there, there's a lot of effort. There's an, uh, an effort that's currently being uh, called the locally led adaptation that is looking to bring a lot of that support further down uh, to the lowest level of government. Um, in Kenya, for example, we have 
decentralized government. So the central government, then you have county governments, that a lot of this work ought to be happening at the county government and the social systems and social protection systems should be built at that level. The role of technology and digitization, we talked about how blockchain has been leveraged to help build more transparent and accountable systems so that at the click of a button, we can release the sort of resources that are needed to people because we have this whole digital money, digital wallet system. So we need to leverage all the tools that we have. But I think that the truth of the matter is those are the issues we're facing and we have to address them. So at the very local level, what's wonderful is people are still able to manage for example, digital money. So how do we get more accountable and transparent in the way we transfer funds for, for social support? But at the end of the day, Maria, it comes down to finance. A lot of the finance that's required to cushion communities against these impacts of climate change is locked up in unfair discussions, especially by the richest parts of this world. And at COP, these are the issues that have to be addressed because the suffering that's happening at the very grassroots is unnecessary and is unjust when you consider the fact that it is climate that is causing all of it. And on this note, a question from Mary Jo Larson on uh, the influence, the importance of the business sector. So um, she's asking, are you hopeful about the increasing priority given to um, environmental and social governance, ESG, sustainability, and accountability um, regarding performance versus rhetoric by financial investors. So talking about the, this funding that is so critical, a lot of these institutions, the World Bank, the IFC, the IMF, the EU, EU and its institutions are talking a lot more about these issues, but is that rhetoric or, or, or how do we get That's why we need good, good accountability uh, structures. Someone ought to hold them accountable for those commitments that they're making. Um, yeah, we have to believe in, in, in the fact that the good human beings are making those commitments, but someone has to hold them accountable. We can trust them, but we have to verify that things are actually flowing. So yeah, accountability structures in place will, will hold those systems accountable. But I think I, for example, have been inspired by the leadership of, of Kristalina Georgieva. I think she's doing a great job and bringing some leadership to the IMF that we just hadn't seen. And, and uh, that ought to be applauded. But, but we are certainly burdened by the lack of action historically from these financial institutions. But this is the moment, they have, to, they have to come forth, but we also have to hold them accountable. So identifying the accountability frameworks, who are those institutions? And I, I really hope UNEP takes on that mantle as well, to be able to make sure that, and, and the work that your center is doing, Maria, to make sure that that data actually gets to those of us who need it. How does that happen? And when does, so that we can hold them accountable. Great, I'll take one last question from, from the participants and then we will, we will wrap up with your vision, uh, Wanjira, of uh, the next 50 years of UNEP and uh, what lessons might you have gleaned from the book for the next, the next 50 years. But Meg Gatonie, who is another one of your compatriots from Kenya and in our PhD program is asking, can you share experience of women activism on conservation, especially marine and freshwater resources in Africa? Well, the, I have to say that um, has continued to be a, mo a, a issue of great pride. So much activism around all manner of issues, plastics, waste, environment, um, urban mobility, uh, just a, a whole slew of issues, young men and women standing up for what they believe in, making, creating and setting up, setting up organizations that are dealing with these issues. Uh, there's, there's a lot of activism in this space, but they, there's, there's also a, um, a growing but not enough solidarity. And I think that the, to the earlier question, about what organizations, especially big organizations like us could do is, um, is to make sure that we stand up and show up and make sure these environmental defenders are not alone. Part of the challenge that they are facing at the moment 
lack of financing and lack of solidarity that makes it a very lonely space to be. But there are many of them. There's uh, Liz Wadhuti who's fighting for green spaces in Kenya, Vanessa Nakate who is fighting for solar um, and energy, uh, energy freedom in Uganda and climate justice and um, Lumide in Nigeria who's fighting to, for clean air in, in Lagos. These are, these are young uh, but, but brilliant activists who are not stopping um, at anything. I know you are nurturing a lot of uh, young leadership uh, in, in Kenya, in Africa, and uh, I think uh, a network of young women activists on environmental issues uh, might, be, might be in the, in the making. Um, so, Wanjira, let's uh, let's close. Let's close with uh, your thinking and your what. What do you see um, UNEP's next fifty years to be, and how do we how do we envision a UNEP at one hundred? My goodness, I'm trying to envision a UNEP five years at a time. So <laughs> it's it is it is a long way out, but I think. You know, kudos to an institution that has has thrived for for 50 years, um, going through all manner of iterations and and still being there, standing up for a sector that is more and more important, and that one we are in under that and one that we are understanding more and more with time. I hope that UNEP will continue to be the go-to uh, institution for all things environment. We are indeed at uh, at the end of of the hour. I'm glad the connection worked uh, worked through uh, almost the entire hour. We're three minutes to to nine o'clock, and uh, I thank uh, everybody for for coming in, joining us here, and uh, I am delighted to announce uh, to announce our next. Um, conversation, our next dialogue in the series UNEP at 50, which will be with uh, Marta Rojas Surego. She is the executive secretary of, she's, excuse me, she is the secretary general of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. This year, Ramsar also celebrates uh, 50th, uh, its 50th anniversary, and uh, we will be celebrating it with a conversation with the Secretary General um, on October 18th. So next month, October 18th at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, we look forward to having, continuing this conversation and uh, celebrating the international environmental institutions that uh, were created 50 years ago. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for engaging in this dynamic conversation with uh, Wanjira Matai. We will be posting the video on uh, YouTube once we uh, finalize it, and uh, we look forward to engaging with all of you who joined us today. Thank you, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>